Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers and this uh, issue of variations. Um, the issue has a great collection of articles that cover the state of the art of upper ocean currents, neural and air sea interaction, ocean circulation, um, transports, how currents interact with waves and structure ecosystems, and the role of surface currents in forecasting and modeling. Um, this issue of variations and the webinar today follows a U.S. CLIVAR workshop we had last year just after the Ocean Sciences meeting. And I, um, we were all totally exhausted after a week of being at Ocean Sciences, and I think nobody was really excited about having another three-day workshop. And it turned out to be an awesome workshop with really great discussion and participation, and I think everyone was pretty happy they they stayed on. So I'm grateful for for uh, that workshop and also the the articles that came out of it. So the the official workshop report that we developed um, should be published in a couple of weeks by U.S. CLIVAR. Um, but the articles in this variations issue highlight uh, some of the major themes that came out of the workshop and, and were discussed. Um, Mark Barasa co-led the workshop organization and also guest edited this special issue of variations with me. Uh, and he unfortunately couldn't be here today, but we both want to give a Enormous uh, thank you to U.S. Clivar, uh, to Mike Patterson, and particularly to Jenny, who really put this all together. And thank you also to the authors for their contributions. Uh, so, Jenny, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. So, today we're going to hear from five of the authors who will present an overview of their articles. Um, Alex Aye from University of Grenoble couldn't make it today. So please make sure to check out his article, uh, Air Sea Interaction and Sub Mesoscale Fronts. So we will start with Shen Elipo from the University of Miami. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much uh, to US Clivar and to the editors of this special issue of Variations uh, for inviting me to uh, write this uh, mini review. Um, and I was very pleased to team up with uh, Jacob Venegrat from the University of Maryland, uh, who will join us in a few minutes um, as well. So vertical structure of near-surface currents, important state of knowledge and measurement challenges. This is the outline of this brief 10-minute overview of that mini review article that we wrote together. Um, and I shamelessly stolen the beautiful graphics from the other authors of the same issue. But the point, I'm not going to go over them, of course, but the point is to, um, you know, show the importance of the vertical structure of near surface currents because um, near surface currents and their vertical structure are basically an expression of the dynamics of the ocean surface boundary layer. And the ocean surface boundary layer is, is itself a component of what people have come to call the air sea transition zone that includes not only the ocean boundary layer, but also the atmospheric boundary layer, as well as the moving interface between the two. There's a lot of um, you know, activities going on about this air sea transition zone. Among some that I'm aware of, there is currently a U.S. CLIVAR working group on air sea interactions. Uh, in 2019, as Kyla mentioned, uh, CLIVAR hosted uh, a workshop on surface currents. I can think also of the Ocean Observing Strategy for Air Sea Interaction, or OASIS, uh, which is right now a UN decade program. Um, so I guess the importance of how uh, currents vary in the vertical near the uh, uh, air-sea interface is really related to the importance of surface currents themselves, whatever that means. So they drive the drift and dispersion of animate and inanimate things uh, of all scales. They drive uh, not only the three-dimensional, but also the temporal distribution of various uh, biogeic or chemical processes. And as such, um, you know, a prerequisite to be able to predict, uh, um, you know, the drift and the distribution of all these components is to have accurate uh, uh, prediction of the vertical structure of surface currents. Uh, vertical mixing and current shear determines actually the horizontal and vertical extents of the drift of things, such as pollutants entering the ocean near the surface, plastic, oil spills, chemical compounds, as well as humans, if they get lost at sea. 
And I just wanted to illustrate that, you know, it can become quite complicated if you think about buoyant things near the surface of the ocean. You want to take into account not only the geometry, but you want to also to take into account the shear of currents near the surface that are responsible for the drift uh, uh, of these objects. And you can start by having no shear, just as in this diagram by this paper by Baron Vera et al. But the shear has to be important over the vertical extent of the objects being drifted around by currents. So I want to talk about the programmatic importance of uh, surface currents and their vertical structure. So there's no clear definition of what a surface current is, uh, but I wanted to point out that the WMO UNESCO uh, Global Climate Ocean Observing System, or JCOS, uh, defines surface currents as one of the 54 essential climate variable, or ECV. At the same time, the Global Ocean Observing System, or GOOSE, of the WRCRP support the Ocean observ Observations Physics and Climate Panel, and they've also defined ocean surface currents as being an essential ocean variable. And for both of these classifications, the relevant specification sheets that anyone can um, you know, uh, consult about surface currents specify that the depth must be stated with, when dealing with this variable. So effectively, it's recognized that you need to take into account the vertical structure or you need to know where you are in the ocean surface boundary layer when you talk about surface currents. It doesn't mean the same thing depending on which depth you're at. So do we have a definition? Um, we don't. And could we collectively come up with definitions and established terminology? So we discussed that to, to a large extent during the workshop and we sort of like threw our hands in the air and say, oh, we can't do it. It's too difficult. Um, but it should be, it, it is actually very important for instrument calibration, comparison between various observations, comparison between model and observations, as well as theory comparisons between theory and observations. We want to make sure we're talking about the same depth. We want to make sure we're talking about the same surface currents. Um, you know, the group for high resolution SST, I'm sure have taken many years to come up with the definition on the right that clearly established, uh, you know, various uh, vocabulary uh, in terms of SST. Could we come up with the same thing about surface currents? Some authors, such as Ross et al, have come up with different terminology about surface currents. And the interesting thing about that terminology is that it relates various names to various dynamical regimes, to various depth scales, and to various time scales. So taking into account that vertical structure effectively. So in terms of the state of knowledge, the dynamical processes involved in creating shear in surface currents, so they include uh, thermal wind shear, wind-driven eggman currents, surface gravity waves, atrophic flows that are associated with some, some mesoscale fronts. So we believe that you know, the understanding of these processes is grounded in uh, relatively well-developed theories, but there are some gaps in the details, of course. As an example, um, we're not sure of the various temporal variability of all these processes, the rectification of these processes across different timescales, or the interaction between, uh, let's say, buoyancy-driven processes and wind-driven Ekman currents, um, as well as wave current interactions, which are, we are going to hear about in one of the next talks. And one of the outstanding challenges is the coupling between the near-surface shear and the turbulent flux divergence. So the gaps in the details are often not well captured by observations, nor are they represented by numerical models, and they stand as a major challenges for operational oceanography, instrument cross calibration, and model development. So more work is needed, basically. We wanted to illustrate some of the you know, various aspects of uh, the vertical structure of near surface currents in the paper. So we're showing two figures. So on the left, I'm showing you a snapshot of the difference of currents at zero meter minus 15 meter in uh, one realization of the hybrid coordinate ocean model or HICOM. Uh, thanks to Brian Arbig for providing this, this data. And so you're seeing the shear, this difference, which is shown as a color for the angle of that shear. And it's, and it's showed as an intensity of the color for, for the magnitude of that shear. And if you look on the globe, you see uh, large patterns that are associated with uh, wind-driven processes. But if you zoom in on uh, the rectangle uh, shown on the, on the globe at the bottom on the left, you see that you have shear on smaller scales. Uh, that corresponds to France and mesoscale activities. You see different colors, meaning that the shear has a different value of rotation. And you can see the interaction between the large scale wind driven pattern and the mesoscale patterns. So there's a lot of um, richness in this numerical simulation 
but include tides and as well as uh, the mesoscale variability, but it doesn't include things such as surface gravity waves as well that would add a layer of complexity onto this pattern for the spatial uh, variability. And on the right, uh, we wanted to exemplify uh, the temporal variability. And this is the example of the well-known uh, diurnal jet where the progressive warming of the ocean surface layer uh, is basically trapping momentum at the top of the ocean accelerating currents in the direction of the wind and creating that downwind jet that acts on diurnal time scale. So we wanted to illustrate the spatial distribution as well as one example of a temporal distribution on the right for the vertical structure of these currents. And to finish, um, so the measurement challenges associated with measuring the vertical structure of near surface currents. Um, so I'm not going to go through, um, no, we didn't intend on doing a review of observational methods. Um, that would be a much longer paper. Um, but, you know, we come up with, we all agree that a comprehensive observations of the vertical structure of near surface currents requires continuous sampling of the water column downward from the oscillating earth interface. And um, I do not think that one single instrument is uh, able to actually uh, capture this. Um, so the methods to measure the vertical structure are going to include uh, Eulerian methods on moorings, as an example, as well as Lagrangian observations, such as, uh, you know, observations from the Global Drifter Program or other dedicated field experiments that have released different type of drifters. Uh, you also have some satellite, airborne, and land-based remote methods that exist or are in development to measure surface currents, but they actually measure the currents only at one depth or provided, um, you know, related to only one processes. Uh, but so ancillary data are necessary to deduce the associated vertical structure. It's very hard to get a shear from remote uh, means. So the distant capabilities as well as limitations of various instrumental platforms suggest that a successful strategy to measure the vertical structure will need to include an integration and synthesis of different type of observations in parallel with theory advancements and numerical modeling to aid the interpretation. So in the paper, we provide a couple of references that have actually been very successful at, um, you know, combining different type of observations to get a continuous sampling. So on the horizon, also, we wanted to point out that there are some proposed satellite missions that are aiming at measuring simultaneously a mixture of surface currents, atmospheric winds, and surface gravity waves. So in that respect, calibration and validations are going to be needed uh, for this type of observations, as well as an understanding of what is actually going to be measured on the ocean side when you want to measure surface currents as an example and compare that to potential satellite measurements. Um, and then so combining observations necessitate an understanding also of the spatial heterogeneity and the non-stationarity of oceanic processes in the surface to make sure you don't actually conflate horizontal and vertical shear and you interpret properly your observations. And that will conclude my presentation. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Shen. That was great. Uh, so we have five minutes for questions. You can put up your hand. Uh, Nadia. Uh, thank you. That was that was very educational. Uh, I was wondering. Uh, so you mentioned satellite missions that are being proposed, and um, uh, in the best case scenario, we're looking at the launch within by the end of the next decade. Is there something we could do meanwhile uh, to prepare for those? Uh, um, distributed system of other measurements in situ measurement platform that you mentioned or modeling capability um, just to maximize this uh, unicorn mission that we are working towards. I think, I think, you know, aiding the future interpretation of, you know, satellite measurements will require maybe, so, you know, we talk about this in the, in the paper, how, you know, there's a lack of common terminology. So I think if observationalists and modelers and, uh, um, uh, you know, theoreticians agreed on the terminology, I think that would help a lot. 
um, and combine observations of different kind and really understand the differences, discrepancies, and uncertainties associated with different observations so that we are on very firm grounds whenever we come to, you know, comparing or calibrating satellite measurements. So, you know, this is a very general answer I'm giving you, but I think, I think this, this is actually what is needed. And when we came together during the workshop, I think it was pretty clear that um, none of us could agree on definitions, let's say. Um, so if you're thinking about specifications or requirements for satellite missions, talking about ocean currents, I think it's going to be difficult to have clear requirements if the scientific community doesn't necessarily agree with definitions. Thank you, Shane. Other questions? All right. Well, let's move on to our next speaker. Thank you, Shen. Um, Thank you. Next up, we have Nick Pizzo from Scripps, who's going to present on behalf of his and Bia's uh, article on uh, wind wave current coupling. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to say a few words today. So I'm Nick Pizzo from Scripps, and this was an article I wrote with Bia Bias Boas, who's at Caltech and Colorado School of Mines. So we were considering the geometry, kinematics, and dynamics of the two-way coupling between wind waves and currents. And to orient us, this is a photo Nick Statham took off the coast of California of waves traveling from left to right in the image, interacting with a submesso scale current feature. And we noticed uh, enhanced and localized wave breaking in this region. And so um, we were motivated by, and, and what we'll talk about today and what we did in the article was mostly a survey of wind wave and current interaction. And these interactions are very interesting in particular because they can facilitate radical fluxes between of mass momentum and energy between the air and the sea. Now, I'm not gonna take us through this slowly. We will go through some of these mechanisms throughout this talk. So this uh, Pink Floyd-esque diagram here will lead us through our interpretation. Like I said, we kind of have three lenses in which we look at these interactions, and we'll start by considering the geometry, and we make the profound statement that the ocean surface is not a rigid lid. And the reason that's the case is that because when wind blows over water, waves are created. And I just want to highlight that this innocuous sounding statement and my, my tone does not... Uh, highlight how actually complex this problem is. And it's actually a lot of the details are still open. And we have an article coming out next month in physics today, uh, Alex Ayet, Luke Dyke, and myself, where we talk about uh, some of the historical development of this problem. But back to the matter at hand. So this is a video provided by Laurence Grayer. Hopefully it's not clipping too much. We were off the coast of California on the research platform FLIP. In a local wind event, you can see some wind waves propagating through our screen, as well as some shorter gravity capillary waves and some parasitic capillary waves, and even some breakers are evident. And so we, we see, and I think we all have an intuition for the fact that the wind can generate waves and that deforms the free surface, and so it affects the geometry between the air and the sea. What's slightly less obvious is that the waves can then feed back onto the wind. So I'm showing you panels from these awesome laboratory experiments from Mark Buckley and Fabrice Veron, where the light gray here is water, the dark gray is air, and the color shows the horizontal velocity normalized by the wind speed at 10 meters. And you can see as the wind speed increases and as the free surface geometry gets more curvature, you start to see sheltering effects. So on the leeward side of the crests, there's some sheltering and even some flow separation. And this is interesting because these authors have shown that this radically modulates how momentum is fluxed from the water column or from the air, excuse me, from the air into the wave field. And so currents can also affect free surface geometry through their interactions with the wave field. So what I'm showing you here is another photo from Nick Statham um, in a study led by Luke Lenane, where we considered uh, the modulation of surface gravity waves by an internal wave, which was propagating from the left to the right in the image. And we get these characteristic rough and smooth bands. And we had a lighter on board and we could actually quantify a variety of properties of the surface waves, including their mean square slope, which were strongly uh, affected by the currents induced by the internal wave. In the upwind direction, we see a factor of nearly three. 
while it's in the crosswind direction, we had modulations that were a factor of about 1.5. And so, of course, this is kind of a 40,000 foot view of what we talked about. There's a lot I'm not going to discuss in this talk. Um, and a lot of this is quite important. Uh, for example, when waves break, they create, they can create spray and bubbles. This greatly increases the surface area between the air and the sea. And so processes that are um, sensitive to fluxes and hence surface areas are strongly dependent on uh, wave breaking. Um, we also discuss how steep and breaking waves modify measurements from remote sensing instruments, including radar and LIDAR. Okay, so we wash our hands of geometry and move on to kinematics. And I start with a another seemingly innocuous statement, and that is when wind blows over water, we saw that it makes waves and it actually puts nearly all of its momentum into that wave field and those waves subsequently break. And that's what generates the so-called wind driven currents. They should be more accurately called the wave breaking driven currents. And people have been looking at this for quite some time and we're gonna go through a simple example and it's, we're gonna examine the mass transport induced by a breaking wave. And so the, the thought experiment we play is if you tell me the variables characterizing a wave packet, I tell you what the mass transport is either from non-breaking or breaking waves. Can we do this? Can we provide a model for this? And so over the years, people have employed several classical tools, um, including state-of-the-art direct numerical simulations. I'm gonna slow this down as well as laboratory studies. Try to have these break concurrently. And these are studies led by Luke Dyka, um, as well as Luke Linane, and then uh, Jimmy Sinis, who's a PhD student at the University of Washington. And what's useful about doing experiments like this is we can track the particle trajectories of water, just Lagrangian uh, particle trajectories, um, and see what they look like. So on the top panel, we see for a non-breaking wave, we have relatively small amounts of drift. And in the bottom panel, we see much larger drift. And this kind of agrees with our intuition if we've ever been surfing. If you try to catch a wave and you miss it, you don't go very far. But if you do catch the wave, you can be transported a great distance. Now, you can quantify the normalized drift velocity as a function of variables described in the wave packet. The details are not important. What's important is qualitatively wave breaking can lead to much larger transport. So there was some desire uh, from the authors to see, you know, whether or not this might be significant at sea. And so the methodology that was employed really goes back to Phillips's work in the 1980s. Um, and my PhD advisor, Ken Melville, pushed this very strongly, and that is to study the dynamics of one event and then take very high resolution measurements of the statistics of those events to build up an estimate for how that um, those events might be uh, useful or not, or whether or not they're significant, I should say, at sea. And so we did this here. We took the transport for one breaking wave. We took um, wave and wave breaking statistics from a half a dozen, or I think it was just actually four field campaigns on flip to estimate whether or not wave breaking induced drift was important at sea. And when you do this, what, what's very useful is, besides the model, is getting the uh, characteristic variables that are important for your parameterization. So we found when we turned the crank that the breaking induced drift was dependent on U star, the wind friction velocity, and HS, the significant wave height. And I'll, I'll show you the magnitude of this shortly. But something that is very important to keep in mind is whether or not those wave and wave breaking statistics are characteristic. So we're, we're going to talk, the community is talking quite a bit about some mesoscale motions, these fine scale current features can respond strongly to the, the wave field can re respond strongly to them as we're seeing here on the left, which is from a paper in review by Theodore Grisica. And the wave field basically goes from the upper right to the lower left and um, through refraction and other processes, there's localization of energy and there's enhanced braking. And what we show in these panels on the right is the momentum flux from the wave field to the water column based on those observed braking statistics in this region and we see N here is a variable normal to the front. Over a distance of just 50 meters, we see an order of magnitude change in the momentum flux um, from the wave field to the water column due to these interactions with currents. And the breaking drift actually exceeds the Stokes drift near this front. And there are many open questions about whether or not this is dynamically significant.
Two minutes and left. So, sorry, what's up? Two minutes. Oh, cool. Um, so there's quite a bit I didn't discuss here that I think is very important. And um, that includes wave current interactions on larger and smaller scales. There's been some really awesome work done lately. There's also the question in the community of uh, on the two way coupling between waves and currents, and we generally take the currents to be frozen. Uh, I think a, a reasonable question is what happens when you relax that condition? And then perhaps most importantly, and this is what Shane was mentioning, what information can we infer about upper ocean currents? So you can actually use the waves not as noise, but as a signal and using their Doppler shifts, you can infer information about the underlying currents. So I'm running out of time and that's good because we're almost done. The last thing we consider is the dynamics. And we know that wind wave and currents modulate vertical fluxes of stuff. And so I'm gonna show you one example on mixed layer deeping by Langmuir circulations. Um, this is a classic observation from Jerry Smith. He observed Langmuir circulation onset at the point of this arrow and then measure the density anomaly to get a deep, a mixed layer deepening rate. Um, here was observed to be 20 meters per hour, but there's only very few observations of this phenomena. And so we are really at a place where, because these large eddy simulations are employing the craig Leibovitch equations to model mixed layer deepening, we need more observations to corroborate this. So I'm out of time. I'm gonna skip right ahead to our vision for the future. So Bia and I argue for concurrent measurements of wave currents and wind all in the same place at the same time. And we're particularly excited about the upcoming S mode venture because of that. We also argue for a combinational approach using theory, laboratory, numerical, and field scientists. And we think it's gonna take all four. And then perhaps most importantly, we argue to diversify our community. We think that the community we work with should more accurately reflect the community we live in as well as the community around the world. And we think only by doing that, can we make progress on these very important questions? I'm done, I swear. Great, thank you, Nick. Um, we'll take questions. So I realized I just kind of, if no one has any questions, I just kind of blasted everybody with information, but something to consider is how to get some of these small scale physicists involved in projects like Clivar just to sit in on the meetings. I think there's some wonderful work being done that's generally in applied math or mechanical engineering departments that I think is directly relevant to the things being discussed in meetings like this. And so, you know, I only heard about this through BIA. My question is how to kind of reach out to other people to see if they want to just be flies on the wall, because that could be useful in, you know, having their expertise in the room. Yeah, definitely. That's a good point. Are there, uh, do you know if there are theoreticians involved in the ESMO experiment? Me, Jim, you, Jim, no. Jim McWilliams, uh, Roger Samuelson's there, Jacob's there. I, I think they're trying to do that. There's a wonderful article by Kerry Emanuel where he petitions to keep theorists involved in some of these projects. And, um, I really love the model of these collaborative projects. It just can be hard when you're doing something like theory because it's so unpredictable. But I do think it's very useful to be involved in these communities. Yeah, definitely. I feel like, you know, including in this Clivar workshop, the, there's often a discussion of the necessity to, to have observationalists and modelers work together, but theoreticians often get left out of that um, framework. So that's a good point. Uh, if we don't have any questions, um, we can move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Nick. Uh, next up is Chi Shi from IM Systems Group. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Chi from IMSG. So uh, thank you for the opportunity today for, uh, for me to share some of my knowledge about current stress and uh, wave coupling and its impact for ocean dynamics, air sea flux fluxes, etc. Uh, I will talk about this topic more in the modeler's perspective. So on large scale, the ocean currents are driven by wind stress, but uh, more research from both observation and modeling studies find that on mesoscale, 
especially in the west of boundary currents regions, um, the currents actually modify the wind stress. And this change of wind stress in its curve can feed back to the ocean and modify the horizontal advection and the vertical motions in the upper ocean. Um, because ocean currents is relatively slow change in variables, uh, missing the currents with uh, currents when the interaction in the numerical models leads to substantial bias in air sea fluxes in the SST. So traditionally, we ignored ocean currents uh, in wind stress calculation because they are uh, one order magnitude smaller than the surface wind. Uh, but using satellite scatterometer observation, uh, it clearly shows that uh, there's uh, ocean currents modifying the surface uh, wind stress over the western boundary currents regions and near the equator. So using the high resolution model, um, there's studies with uh, one-way coupling currents with um, uh, when we coupling ocean with atmospheric model or two-way coupling, uh, both shows that um, when we consider currents, uh, there will be substantial reduction of wind stress in eddy kinetic energy near strong currents in the mesoscale eddies. So here is a idealized uh, meander uh, that. Uh, show the dashed line is the current speed. So the current speed is highest near the core and assume that the current speed is at the same direction of the wind stress. Then there will be like a reduced wind stress in the core and larger wind stress on both sides. This introduces the, the wind stress curve and it further causes up, upwelling and downwelling near the meander. So the using um, ocean atmospheric cu coupled model model on um, Song at all 2020 find that the Ekman eddy kinetic energy reduction is not limited to the surface layer. It can penetrate up to 100 meters depth under the water. Also because of the uh, current stress induced the wind stress curve. Uh, this will impact the vertical velocity and the bio, biogeochemical process in the upper ocean. So another variable that makes the current stress coupling more complicated is, is the presence of waves. So in um, for my PhD study, um, I used the ocean atmospheric waves three-way coupled modeling system uh, to study this impact. Um, um, the atmospheric model will calculate the wind stress, surface heat fluxes, etc., and use this to driven the ocean model. And the ocean model will fed back the surface temperature and surface currents. Um, same way, the atmospheric model also drives the wave model. And the wave model fed back the wave height and the wavelength to the atmospheric model to modify the surface roughness. And between the ocean model and atmospheric model, there is a wave currents interaction. Um, um, several wave, uh, wave currents interaction algorithm options you can choose. Um, so this for this coupling modeling system. They are running together in the stop every 10 minutes to exchange data fields. So here's the result um, when we couple the uh, current wave stress, um, wind stress together. So unlike the results from just the coupling currents in the wind stress, um, the wind stress actually increased in the Gulf Stream area. Uh, and uh, um, similar to previous studies, we see those uh, positive and negative vertical velocities next to each other along the strong currents area. And we also find the wave currents interaction increased uh, wave height uh, in the Gulf, Gulf Stream area. So um, 
for the ocean frontal area, there's a strong sea surface temperature gradient. So it's very sensitive to the change of wind stress um, and the vert uh, horizontal advection. So when we add those coupling to the model system, we can see find a significant sea surface temperature change up to one degree um, near the frontal area. Moreover, in the frontal area, the surface wind are also highly coupled with the uh, SSD. Um, so there's a um, surface wind are slower over the cool side of the uh, front front and the stronger over the warm side of the front. So it also creates local uh, wind stress curve and a convergence and divergence. So that makes the coupling process more complicated. So to summarize uh, what we find uh, in our three-way coupled modeling system, um, so there's a uh, complex feedback processes. Uh, the wind stress drive the currents in waves and the currents feedback by wind shear and the wave of feedback to the wind stress by surface roughness. The change of wind stress will cause vertical uh, motion change that will change the surface temperature. The current change also cause the horizontal advection, which also change the surface temperature. Waves also have, um, like I uh, mentioned in the previous um, uh, talk, that they have a different mechanism, cause vertical mixing, et cetera, and change the SST. So, it will further change the heat fluxes and the cloud and the precipitations in the atmosphere. So to um, the last slide, um, so there's some future works um, we can work on is um, investigate those coupling process on like tro tropical storm intensities and the precipitations in the biogeochemical processes. And also when we want to validate our numerical model uh, output with the observations, we find that there's not enough uh, spatial resolution of the observation. Um, so we, are, we want more like a high resolution observation for our model validation. Um, that's all, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Chi. Uh, do we have any questions? So I have a question. You, what is the current um, spatial and like what resolution in time and space uh, do we need? I would say uh, five kilometers, maybe five ten kilometers for wind waves and currents. Yeah. Do you have any comments on like what the biggest gaps or limitations are in implementing three way coupling in models? Is it understanding or is it computing power or other? I mean, technology wise, now coupled model is um, pretty mature, but I feel like uh, what uh, I it's the understanding of those physics, as Nick mentioned before, there's a lot of um, unknown about how waves um, impact or how they act in the interface is still unknown. So I feel like that's a great challenge for our modeler. Any other questions? All right, well, let's move on to our next speaker, who's Matt Carrier from NRL. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Carrier. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm an oceanographer with the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. Um, today, I'll be talking about forecasting currents, uh, specifically some approaches and challenges for data simulation and how that feeds into ocean modeling. Uh, my co-authors are listed here at the bottom. All right, so some just some cursory information. Why are currents important? Well, from a forecasting perspective, of course, uh, they come in handy for a variety of reasons. 
Uh, this can include search and rescue operations. Uh, this is both for civilian and also for uh, naval operations. Uh, of course, everybody remembers the, um, the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico with the Deepwater Horizon. So hydrocarbon release and tracking and forecasting has become a very important uh, feature as well for ocean models. Uh, drift prediction, uh, this of course has a lot of naval applications and shipping is also affected by the ocean currents. Uh, as far as assimilation goes, um, this is another aspect of currents that are important, and that is because the ocean, as most of us know, is, is undersampled in terms of observations. And the surface ocean currents provide information uh, regarding the sea surface uh, height gradient and the subsurface thermal structure uh, of the ocean. So it gives us a lot more information than just currents. We can, we can actually use this to identify locations of, of eddies and fronts and correctly position those in our model, which of course has uh, uh, various impacts to uh, many of the forecasting applications uh, that, that come from our ocean models. So it, it's obviously very important. And there are various forms uh, of ocean current measurements uh, that are available. Of course, in situ measurements are one. Uh, I listed a couple here that, that are probably the most uh, uh, widely available. Uh, of course, the remotely sensed acoustic Doppler current profiler. I have a little uh, cartoon there on the right with a, a ship with a downward looking uh, ADCP. Uh, also high frequency Radar, HF radar is also something that's uh, pretty widely available these days. Uh, these are mostly coastal, uh, of course, giving us uh, currents at the surface up to about 200 kilometers from the, uh, the coastline. So these are really more of a, of a near shoreline type of observation. Um, also, uh, Lagrangian sources have also become available. These include surface drifters and also profiling floats. Um, I have a little picture here. This is from the Grand Lagrangian deployment of surface drifters in uh, 2012. So this is actually the tracks of, of all 300 drifters that were deployed uh, during this experiment. You can see that it's, uh, they, of course, they, they cover a very wide area in the Gulf of Mexico during this time period. So surface drifters, of course, are, are, are very uh, powerful uh, source of information for uh, near surface currents. And we can also uh, use this information to derive uh, Eulerian velocities as well by simply taking the difference of the drifter position over time. And for the rest of this talk, that's that's actually the source of uh, observation I'll be discussing, because that's the one that, that we have used the most uh, at the US Navy. So before we get into that a little bit, I just want to talk about the role of data assimilation and, and some uh, things that, that need to be kept in mind when you're trying to assimilate uh, ocean currents into your forecast model. Um, for the applications that we do at the U.S. Navy, we're really more interested at this point in the large scale uh, currents and mesoscale currents around eddies. Uh, sub mesoscale uh, currents are, are a little more difficult to, to get to. And, and quite frankly, I'm not sure we have the observations to support those. So we're really trying to shoot uh, for the target that, that I think is achievable. And so, you know, of course, large scale ocean currents, they result of balance between the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force. And I have a little uh, picture over here on the right. Uh, we have a, a warm anomaly uh, position here, a cold anomaly here, and of course the uh, surface expression of the sea surface height uh, over top. This induces a, a sea surface height gradient. And of course you get movement of water. That water then bends to the right in the Northern Hemisphere and you get uh, a clockwise current around warm anomalies and a counterclockwise current around cold anomalies around these eddies. Now, what's important for ocean currents is if I have a data simulation system and I simply just adjust the, uh, the surface currents without taking any of this into account, and I feed that to the ocean model, if the ocean model still has this underlying uh, structure set up, it will quickly erase what my data simulation told it to do and just switch back the currents that fit with this underlying structure. Uh, th I, this may seem like a, a simple thing and, and kind of a, a duh moment, but uh, you know, for, for a lot of people, you know, this is something that kind of catches you when you're doing data simulation. So um, it's important to build in dynamical balance constraints into your data simulation system. This can be done uh, through, the through the background error covariance. Uh, this can be done through uh, various means, including explicit operators, uh, ensembles, if you have, uh, say, a common filter system. Uh, or in the case of the 40 var, it can be achieved through the action of the tangent linear and adjoint operators, uh, which provide the dynamical balances that come from the ocean model itself. So as far as the observations themselves go, there's some, uh, some treatment uh, considerations to be made here as well. Uh, particularly for drifters, uh, they are subject to a number of issues when it comes to ocean current assimilation. Uh, one of them is unrealistic ac accelerations. 
And this is mainly due to improper retrieval by passing ships. And we've seen this a number of times. You'll see a drifter floating along and then just take a beeline to the shore. And sometimes you can actually even trace it down highways, which is kind of funny. Um, but that's an issue, obviously. So that's something you need to be uh, keep in mind and need to, uh, to QC your data for. Uh, another one that's a little harder to track is the loss of a drogue. Uh, drifters uh, use a little sail uh, that can go down to some various depths um, in order to get more of the current um, to affect the, the drifter as it floats along and to reduce the amount of effect of the wind and wave on the, the trajectory of the, of the drifter. If that drogue is lost, obviously you're going to get a, a drifter that's going to be more impacted by the wind and wave action. If you're trying to get the currents, that's a problem. So that has to be QC'd as well. Um, inertial oscillations are also an issue. These are high frequency motions that are not representative of the large scale mean motion that we're attempting to, to uh, constrain in our ocean models. And I have a little movie of that here. This is actually from our uh, ocean model, the uh, Navy Coastal Ocean Model um, off the southeast coast of Louisiana. The top picture here, you'll see that we have some surface currents. Uh, there's a little eddy here and a little eddy here. But you'll see this circular pattern that's occurring. And, and, that's, and the model, of course, is resolving the inertial uh, oscillations. The drifters do experience these themselves. Uh, so the issue here is that the inertial oscillations may not match, obviously, between your observation and the model. And it's not what you're trying to correct. Uh, so what we have to do is we have to filter those ocean, uh, those inertial oscillations in our ocean model and also do the same uh, from the Eulerian velocities that we're calculating from our drifters. And that can be done by simply calculating the, the, the Eulerian velocity with drifters that are far enough apart in time uh, that you can account for this effect. All right, so let's get to some applications in the few minutes I have left in this presentation. Um, first one is from uh, the ENCODA 40 bar, and I'll get to what that is in a moment. And of course, the aforementioned GLAD drifters. Uh, these were 300 custom-made GPS track drifters that were deployed uh, in the summer of 2012. And we uh, derived Eulerian velocities from these and assimilated them into our 40 bar system. Now, the 40 bar system itself is the Navy coupled ocean data assimilation system. Uh, it comes with a 3D bar and 40 bar option. Um, in this case, this system is uh, fully multivariate with uh, built in dynamical balance relationships uh, that allow us to properly assimilate velocities. And I have a little example of that here at the top. This is off the southeast co uh, corner of Japan. Uh, this is from a single SST observation. And what you're seeing here is the time evolving correction to the ocean model. Uh, in the temperature field uh, during a 24-hour assimilation window. This over here is the sea surface height and velocity increments that are produced from the multivariate uh, background error covariance that is inherent with the, uh, the tangent linear NADRA models. So we're able to correct uh, all ocean fields from one observation. So this is important because when we assimilate velocities, we need to be able to correct the underlying thermodynamic structure as well. So this is just uh, one example from uh, the experiment that we ran, I believe, in 2014 with this data. Uh, the panel on the left is the upper northeast co uh, uh, sorry, area of the Gulf of Mexico. This is from a run with no velocity assimilation. On the right is the run from velocity assimilation. These are both 96-hour forecasts using NCOM. And what you're looking at here, these dots are all the actual observed drifter positions uh, through the 96-hour time frame. The color, uh, the, the color coding, on the other hand, though, is indicative of the separation distance between these observed drifters and the drifters that were simulated with the model currents, which are not shown. Uh, the takeaway here pretty much is that uh, the more blue these dots are, the better agreement there is over 96 hours between the forecaster drifters and the observed drifters. And we can clearly see that with uh, no velocity simulation, especially in the vicinity of this loop current eddy, the color uh, quickly go to red as the model uh, drifters diverge very fast away from the observed drifters over time. However, the 96 hour forecast that was uh, constrained at the analysis time using velocity assimilation maintains uh, a, a more close match between the two drifters, uh, the modeled and the observed uh, over time as we see more blue and yellow uh, during this time frame. So certainly there was a, a substantial correction and you'll also notice, too, the underlying velocity structure obviously is very different uh, between the two models. So I have a, a, little, a little snippet here, a little snapshot of that. Uh, this is the same model run, but just comparing just a few key uh, um, drifters between the, uh, the, uh, the observations, which are in green, and the model, which are in purple. And from the, uh, the run that has the no-velocity VA, 
uh, against the run width, the velocity data simulation, we can clearly see that the underlying structure of the sea surface height and of course, the underlying uh, thermodynamic structure is very different from the model that includes velocity data simulation. And the drifters match up much better uh, over the 96 hour time period uh, with the observed tracks. So this is showing some of the power of, of assimilating uh, velocity observations that can correct uh, so much of the ocean model uh, given enough observations to work with. Two minutes. All right, I will very quickly go through this. Um, we also have an example. This is very recent uh, from uh, some work that we just finished up this past year with ENCODA 3D VAR. Uh, 3D VAR system that we've had for the Navy uh, has been unable to assimilate velocity data for the longest time and, and also sea surface height data uh, as well due to a lack of appropriate background error covariance built into the solver. Uh, in fact, we had to use an outside module known as ISOP or Improved Synthetic Ocean Profiles to assimilate sea surface height data by creating synthetic TNS profiles. And it does that uh, through a variational, uh, a separate variational assimilation technique, which includes uh, some information from climatology and from historical uh, observations. Uh, what we've done though, is we've actually taken the covariances within that system and we've now incorporated them directly into the 3D bar. So now it can do this assimilation directly. And this is our first result from that work. This is uh, from a uh, project with DARPA called the Ocean of Things where a number of drifters, uh, you can see their tracks here in these little white lines, were released in the Northern Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the top panels here are from a uh, analysis with no assimilation of velocities. The bottom is with the assimilation of velocities. And I'll call your attention to the temperature and currents at 100 meters. Um, quite frankly, the eddy here without velocity assimilation is misplaced to the Northeast based on what we see from the drifter tracks. But when we include velocity assimilation through the 3D bar, we now have repositioned the eddy appropriately and restructured the velocity vectors so that everything matches up quite nicely uh, with the drifter trajectories. So uh, conclusions of future work, um, ocean current observations do provide a substantial amount of information regarding the ocean surface and its interior. Uh, the ocean is vastly undersampled. So including these, uh, these powerful observations uh, it is uh, something that we are very much uh, in agreement with and looking forward to uh, in the future. Uh, proper constraint of the ocean model current field can, of course, lead to improved forecasts for surface drift and other uh, operations. And this is the most important thing. Increasing the number of usable ocean current observations is a vital goal for ocean forecasting. I'm sure for the community at large, but certainly for the Navy. Uh, and that is something that uh, we've been pushing for uh, quite a bit, actually. So we're looking forward to getting more of that data and getting our hands on that. And I think that's all I have. Awesome, thank you. Um, we have time for questions. Uh, Brian Urbic here, if that's okay. Go for Hi, it. Hello, Brian. Hi, Matt, how are you? Um, sorry if you said this and I missed it, but as you know uh, it, from our work in the global HICOM that you use as uh, boundary forcing, there's interesting questions about data simulation in the presence of fast and slow motions that basically you know, when you um, assimilate, for instance, altimeter eddies, that's kind of basically an, a geostrophic adjustment problem. It forces the eddies in the model to move over and you generate all these spurious waves. So I guess it's just a comment that I think this is a general problem and I hope we can work to rectify it because I'm sure you have the same problem in the regional models. Maybe you've thought a bit about it. Yeah, we absolutely do have that problem. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Um, it, it's something that we haven't had a solution for yet. Um, it's not as much of a problem in the, it, it is a problem in the 3D bar for sure. Um, we're finding that for the 4D bar, which is currently in trans transition to operations, that it is, uh, it can be a substantial problem. Um, one of the things that we've done, at least insofar as that uh, system goes, we are running the 4D bar now at much lower resolution for the analysis. So say we run the forecast at two kilometer, we can't really run the analysis at two kilometer, it produces way too much noise. Uh, so we're having to run it at a much lower resolution in order to just correct those larger scale features. Um, when we introduce that back into the model, of course, that still has some issues in, in producing some of those um, those fast motions, as you mentioned. Um, that's something that I think we're still looking into and don't have a real good solution for at this at this time. Yeah, we have a proposal with uh, Bob Helber to 
start looking at this. I think it's a very big problem. I mean, it's something that the meteorologists probably have spent a few decades on, you know, how to rattle the system without, you know, generating too much spurious activity. It's it's particularly an issue with the with the regional models because what we found is that you, when you generate those kind of uh, those kind of fast motions, they they uh, radiate outwards and they actually hit the boundaries and reflect back yeah. in. And yeah. that's something that we've had a, a substantial amount of problems with, uh, especially with the 40 bar. So that's, um, yeah, I agree with you. It's something that definitely needs to be corrected. Yeah, let's work more on it. Thanks. Um, we have a question from Shen. Um, thank you, Kayla. Uh, so Matthew, in your last uh, slide, which is still on the screen, the, your last point is increasing the number of usable ocean current observations. Could you elaborate what you mean by usable? Uh, <laughs> Um, I think I just get a little wordy sometimes. Um, it really, any ocean current observation that we can assimilate, um, I, I think we want to get our hands on. Um, so far, we've been really kind of stuck with drifters and floats, uh, which are which are great. But the problem is that outside of um, you know the, these field experiments, you're not going to get a whole bunch of them, and so they don't have as much impact on your forecast model as say dropping 300 of them in a small area will have. Um, I know there's been some talk and about so just, uh, set. Oh, go ahead. No, sorry. I was just so you know, as you assimilate different type of observations like drug drifters, undrug drifters, HF radar. Like, do you pay attention to you know what depth they represent, and you know, compared to your model, do you pay attention to that? Is it important? Uh, to some degree, we do, and I think it is important. Um, as as was being mentioned before, you know, the the notion of what's a what's a surface current. What, what what do these drifters particularly? What do they really represent in terms of the current at what level? Um, that that's hard to get to. Uh, oftentimes, we'll just take the simplest approach and assume that the current is at the surface, and that's what we're trying to correct. Um, whether that's correct or wrong, I'm I'm not sure. But even even the sur yeah even the surface what we're... right it's it's going to be there. Right, so, you know, I, I guess, I guess this is something that needs to be clarified uh, whenever, you know, data assimilation systems are looking for data and trying to understand what they represent. Oh, that represent oh I agree. Completely in, agree. Into a model. So, I, I think that's something that needs to be thought. Thanks. And we'll take a last question from Jim Carton. Uh, thanks. Hey, actually, I just uh, had a question about a little detail. It, presumably, there's uh, some kind of window for the 40 var. I was just wondering how wide that window is. Um, it's variable. Uh, it depends on the domain, and it depends on the on the tangent linear stability. Um, for most of the cases we've been running, it's been about a 72 hour window. Although I think I showed a, one test case here, which was a 24. Okay, uh, so it's it's pretty short. That that's really what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, thanks. yeah. It, and it, we could run it longer for for many of the domains, but we we have an operational time constraint that we're trying to fit within. So really 72 hours about right. as long as we can right. go that's, that. That's what I was wondering about it, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for the presentation and we'll have our next speaker, uh, who's our final speaker, Ali De La Pena, who's from the University of Auckland. Uh, thank you everyone for being here today. And I'd like to thank uh, US Clivar and the guest editors for this uh, variations issue for the invitation to talk today, but also write a short review of about how ocean currents affect marine ecosystems. So we are very much into the application part of uh, looking at ocean currents. Today I will focus on how ocean currents um, near near the surface and beyond can affect marine open ocean ecosystems at a fine scale. And I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors, Cameron Brown, Peter Gaube, and Francesco Davidio. I'd like to start from the very the inspirational applications for uh, this work. Uh, the open ocean is arguably the least protected biome on Earth. Here on the right, there is a map of which parts of the ocean are protected. And you may see that, first of all, there are very few. Um, we're about 7.7% of the ocean that has some sort of protection, but if we look at full protection, uh, well, at less than 3%. And this uh, has been uh, suggested by the United Nations that needs to be raised to 30% by 2030. So there's a lot of work to do. You may also notice that most of these marine protected areas are 
in coastal regions. And that's partially because those are regions uh, that are heavily impacted by humans. But there's also um, another problem that is that protecting the open ocean is very challenging, both from a juridical and enforcement perspective, but also in terms of science. And that's where I think us as oceanographers can make a contribution. Questions that uh, are part of these challenges include how do we prioritize key regions in the open ocean and how we, do we deal with the fact that these key regions may move in space and time on a relatively rapid uh, scales. The interaction between um, ocean currents and marine ecosystems occurs at a variety of scales, uh, but today I will focus on what I call here the fine scales. And this is a broad umbrella that encompasses features such as eddies, fronts, filaments, meanders. So we're covering basically the mesoscale and the submesoscale, looking at features that uh, are from one to 100 kilometers uh, large and with lifetimes from a few hours to a few days. These are the oceanic equivalent of weather patterns, and uh, we know they play a key role in heat, energy, and salt budgets. But they're also, they also overlap in terms of spatial and temporal scales with crucial processes in open ocean ecosystems. And these include, for example, uh, the blooming of phytoplankton or the typical duration of foraging trips of apex predators. And here I'm just showing uh, an image from a satellite um, ocean color map that is showing us some example of these features, including eddies and small filaments and fronts. And we can see that they are structuring the color of the ocean and these differences in color are the reflection of the abundance and the type of phytoplankton present in the water. So you can see that having uh, structures like this that move in time may be quite challenging if we want to put a limit to an area that is uh, ecologically significant. Thanks to the development of uh, um, altimeters and ocean color satellites, indeed, the impact uh, that ocean currents have on phytoplankton is possibly the most well-known uh, part of our understanding of um, open ocean ecosystems. But even for organisms that are quite simple, the relationship is quite complex. Basically, currents regulate um, the access that phytoplankton have to light and nutrients. That is what phytoplankton needs to grow, but also their accessibility to grazers. So we're looking at both sides of the balance between growth and mortality. And without going into detailed mechanisms, these mechanisms um, include vertical mechanisms, such as the modulation of the mixed layer or uh, eddy pumping or the interaction with uh, the wind, but also horizontal mechanisms that include the trapping and steering of water masses that include perhaps a different phytoplanctonic community or a more abundant one. If we take an ecological perspective and climb up the marine food web, we find out that things become even more complicated as we start to consider animals. Um, and if we think about zooplankton or micronecton, that is a broad range of small fishes and squids and crustacea, things become even more complicated because these animals have some degree of motility. So they can move most often uh, than not along the vertical and therefore it changes which horizontal currents they're experiencing. And that's why it's critical to know well what is the vertical structure of the currents because uh, depending on where these animals are, they will be affected by a different current field. These organisms are really important, even if they're quite uh, unknown. Uh, they're the prey of many uh, apex predators and megafauna. They play a key role in the carbon cycle that is understood only with very large error bars. Uh, so we, we need to learn more. And, but we don't know much partially because they're very difficult to measure. Uh, you can't tag them. Um, many of them spend a lot of time in the deep ocean. So they're very hard to observe. And as I said earlier, there, there is some motility, so we can't just consider them as uh, full on plankton. There is limited but growing evidence of the variability of the distribution of these organisms at the meso scale. Uh, we don't know much about finer scales, but for example, uh, I'd just like to share this example from a, a recent, recent work that we published 
um, this plot is showing the seasonal anomaly of acoustic backscattering, that is a common proxy used to characterize the abundance and community composition of these organisms. So this is the seasonal anomaly as a function of depth, and it's uh, these different curves indicate the averages across um, a bunch of cyclonic eddies in blue, anticyclonic eddies in red, and just locations outside of the eddies in black. And we can see that there is quite an, uh, a strong pattern showing us that anticyclonic eddies seem to have uh, are to be characterized by a very um, a much stronger, potentially more abundant uh, community of these organisms down into uh, down to the mesopelagic, but also um, as these organisms might migrate, that they may occur near the surface as well. If we keep going up the marine, the open ocean food web, uh, we find organisms that we paradoxically understand a lot better, and these are apex predators. And this is mostly due to uh, the recent progress that has been done in animal tracking. This work has been pioneered with uh, marine mammals and pinnipeds, and now we are starting to have animal tracking observations from seabirds and sharks and a lot of these organisms, a lot of these animals seem to spend a lot of time near fronts and eddies. And I'd like to show this with an example from two sharks, including the one that is depicted in this photo. Uh, we are in the Northwest Atlantic. And basically every time the dorsal fin of this shark breached across the surface of, of the ocean, we get a location of where that shark was. So we get all these little dots and they are color coded by whether they are inside an eddy or not. So the black dots indicate locations that are outside of eddies and meanders, whereas the pink and the green ones indicate locations that were that correspond to eddies and meanders. And you can see that even if this is a region that is highly dynamical because we are in the wake of the Gulf Stream, the, there is a huge percentage of locations that occur inside these features. And this is not something that happens only with sharks. It has been observed with a variety of animals, including uh, elephant seals and penguins. And even if there is a growing understanding of that, uh, we're still very far to be sure about why that happens. So there is this collocation, there is this association, and a handful of mechanisms have been suggested. One is the fact that uh, circulation features may be trapping profitable waters, so the predators would go there to feed. Uh, but there is also evidence of a direct effect of ocean currents, just the push of the current, even on large animals such as elephant seals. There's also a factor of uh, the increased um, accessibility to prey, and this is likely to be important for fish that has a very narrow thermal niche, where being in an area uh, where the water is slightly warmer means that these fish can dive deep, uh, can dive deeper and poten potentially access more prey. And this is just an image here on the right to give you an idea of the complexity and the kind of interaction that these uh, trajectories. Uh, this is from an elephant seal, so we get a higher resolution because elephant seals need to breathe near the surface. Uh, we can see some interaction with mesoscale eddies, but also if we zoom in, we find out that this interaction is pretty complex and that's where we really need to be able to match the location of our biological observations with the most appropriate currents. So I think I sent you to uh, through an adventure going through an entire ecosystem, but there are still a lot of open questions and it's hard to summarize them, but I divided them into three groups. The first one is a, a challenge with resolution. Uh, the studies that I've been showing and that occur in this field are generally relying very heavily on altimetry, which means that we're only seeing the large mesoscale features and we're to totally missing out of, on the smaller ones and also on the some mesoscale ones and also on the asymmetry and anisotropies on the edges of uh, large mesoscale features. You may also have noticed that um, a lot of these um, this, this example that I've been showing are about how many animals are somewhere, how much. Everything is about abundance and biomass, but we know that for biogeochemical cycles and ecology, 
we need to actually distinguish between different groups and between different physiological states. So we need to know exactly what types of organisms are where and um, how, how well they are. And we're really far uh, in that respect. And finally, as I may have hinted a few times, most of the studies show associations and we're still lagging behind when it comes to mechanisms with maybe the exception of uh, phytoplankton. So there's a lot to look forward to. Thanks. Uh, there's a lot to look forward to. Uh, I think with uh, SWOT, we will be able to get better matches between fine, finer scale features and biological observations and eventually resolve uh, finer scales. Just a, a year later, there is a plan to launch another satellite that is uh, PACE. And this will hopefully give us an opportunity to go beyond chlorophyll and phytoplankton and potentially distinguish between different types of plankton. And finally, um, there is the potential for satellite scatterometry in a further away future. Staying on, on Earth, um, the development of the technology of animal tracking, I think, is very promising. We can tag more animals because these uh, technologies are becoming cheaper, both in terms of numbers and species but also uh, the array of sensors that we can use has uh, increased. So for example, we can now set acoustic sensors on some of these organisms. And finally, just to look back as I'm running out of time, what does what would this mean for conservation? The idea is to get a mechanistic understanding of how currents structure marine life in the ocean. And this will give us tools to prioritize open ocean regions for protection and eventually get to um, dynamic ocean management that will uh, respect the dynamic nature of uh, the ocean. And I think that's all from me. Thanks a lot for your uh, attention and I take in any questions. Sally, so going back to your, uh, your future ideas or you know next steps, mm -hmm. what do you think is the potential for like the utility of combining SWOT data with PACE data to answer some of these questions. Is that realistic or kind of just a, a dream? Uh, I think it, right now it sounds realistic, but it really depends on what happens. I would say mostly with PACE. So PACE will include hyperspectral observations um, of ocean color. And we do that already in the field with water samples and with the water samples, it, there are some optical tools that actually allows to distinguish between different types of uh, phytoplankton and even some aspects of their physiological state. So if anything even weakly similar was to be done with PACE, uh, that would be great. And even if, um, so I think there is a lot of potential for combining those two uh, technologies. So it's very, I think we're very fortunate that they would be up at a similar time. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from Roger. Oh, yeah, that was an interesting talk. Uh, and I am wondering, thinking back to some of the earlier talks, which mentioned the possibility of shear between the very surface current <laughs> at the interface uh, in the upper few meters of the ocean and how we don't understand that very well. And I'm just wondering whether that has important biological consequences from your perspective or not, or what's your perspective on that? Uh, I think it depends on the organism. I'm quite sure that shear plays a big role for the distribution of zooplankton, um, because there are, some of these organisms are quite small, so for them, uh, strong shear means potentially a barrier that they cannot cross. I don't know if there is a lot of work that has been done on that, but I think it might matter. Uh, actually quite a lot. And the other potential interaction that I can think about, but I don't know if any work has been done on that, is for larger animals who can cross uh, even strong gradients and strong currents, they may be able to somehow sense the shear and use that as a cue for, to make decisions about where to go. Because in, in the field, there's also a lot of questions about how do the animals who can move around, such as sharks or elephant seals, decide uh, how do they find fronts and features like that. And 
there are different theories, including that perhaps they can smell dying phytoplankton that may be accumulating on the front. Uh, they may follow temperature cues, but there is some, but I think there's something that could be explored. Um, but I, I never really thought about that um, from that perspective. What I've seen in acoustic data is that sometimes uh, if you look at um, shear from ADCP, that tends to match with um, patterns also in other forms of uh, acoustics for zooplankton and fish. So it, it's a bit tricky because the ADCP is also using things in the water to make the measurements. But uh, I think there is some potential to do something interesting there. Okay, great. Thank you. Any last questions for Ali or for any of the speakers before we wrap up? All right. Well, thank you, Ali and everyone. And Thanks. I will turn it over to Jenny. Thank you, Kyla. Um, I want to echo what Kyla said. A uh, big thank you to Shane, Nick, G, Matt, and Ali for presenting at today's webinar and to all the authors for contributing articles to this variations edition on new frontiers for ocean surface currents. I also want to give a big thank you to Kyla and Mark for leading the organization of this edition and to Kyla for helping moderate today's webinar. So the recording of the webinar will be available hopefully tomorrow and an announcement will be made through our US Cliver communication modes. So our Twitter, our website and the October newsgram. And also, as Kyla mentioned earlier, um, stay tuned to those channels for the announcement of the 2020 surface currents workshop report, which will be released in a couple of weeks. So thank you all for attending and have a great day.